Oh, wow. Okay. So we already have an agenda and everything. Yeah, I, I, I feel it. myself down. We'll give it a few more minutes to fill in the agenda and we'll get started. Okay, let's get started. Um, so first up on the agenda, we have this PerfScale audit tool. I think, yeah, this is mine. Um, <clears throat> what do we have left here? Does anyone, does everyone feel pretty decent about the, uh, if we look at the description, I updated the description with a workflow that kind of shows how we can start, uh, give it the start time, given the end time and then uh, capture the results during that time and then also um, compare those results to thresholds. So we give an input config with our uh, desired thresholds. Um, so we want to know that we get to running uh, BMI to running state within X amount of time. And then when we get the output, we'll both get what the P95, P99, P50, whatever um, results were and whether that met our thresholds. We could use that for our like, periodic testing and things like that. Does that satisfy everyone how that's kind of all laid out? Are there any comments or concerns there? Yeah, uh, looks good to me. Okay. I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing it in act like uh, if when we can output it somehow in after our job runs, maybe. Yeah, it looks good to me also. Um, my only concern now, but it's not to block the PR, so I think it should be merged, um, is with the new tool. I don't know if how new is that, but the, the one that you just marked, the, um, that's the second one, the cluster profiler. Um, I think they share, you know, Similarities for the work, you know, the performance framework, and I, I just made some comments in actually in the Kubernetes cluster profiler, and I maybe it would be better to have everything in only one place, you know, instead of have like a lot of different tools spread around, we could have like a this. This profiler, which in the end, the audit tool, it's something like that also, isn't it? We are collecting some metrics from Prometheus and creating a report. And I, it might be maybe a good idea to merge things together. So then we have like a single tool to, you know, the profiler profiling the, the application performance. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Um, <clears throat> so maybe let's jump to that uh, that Qvert cluster profiler PR. So that's the second one in our agenda, and it's kind of related to the audit tool. Um, it's something. So this this Qvert cluster profiler, um, it does something a little bit different than the audit tool right now. And maybe there's a way to converge this behavior. Uh, certainly, we could um, make 
this uh, perf audit tool do both types of behavior, but I'll give a brief rundown of the differences real quick. So the audit tool is taking a time range, going to Prometheus, pulling uh, data around uh, or through that time range and then compiling some results and comparing that to the threshold. So it's something that could be done retroactively. The profiler is something that we uh, run and it actually triggers things like tracing or other like th things in our actual components to begin capturing data. Uh, and then it has to be started at the very beginning, like before the stress test starts, and it has to be stopped and dumped at the end of the stress test. And this gives us things like PPROF uh, dumps for CPU and memory, so we can figure out where we spent the most time in execution. And I added something that I think is a little bit controversial, uh, where I'm um, figuring out what, I'm counting what API resources we're calling and the actions. So, for example, uh, I'm counting how many times every component calls a list or a git on a specific resource, like a pod, and I'm aggregating all those into a report. Uh, and that's something that we can get um, in the, the, uh, the dump as well. So that part, possibly we could put that in Prometheus. I'm unsure how to represent it. I'd like to hear people's thoughts on how I could make a Prometheus metric that would give us the kind of data that I'm looking for and that HTTP request um, counts, the aggregate counts. Um, so the, I, I really like the PPROF part. Uh, I've said it before, I, I'm, I've been looking at distributed tracing the last two days and um, I'm still, I, I, the PPROF part might actually be more useful to some extent or like than that. Um, for the request metrics, I think, I, or I thought we already had those metrics somehow, um, or we, we, we collect them and they, I asked it in the comments, I think, uh, if we could use the metrics where we collect, the, the difference might be they are not as granular or not as uh, up to date. I wouldn't pull them from Prometheus. I don't think I would mix the two tools, so one pulling from Prometheus. I, the only thing I would change is we have the counters in our code and we might be able to read the counters we already have instead of building new counters. Um, but this tool seems like the, the, the cluster profile seems more like something any operator could implement. And I like that idea. And I wouldn't mix it up with too much specifics that we can do externally. Does that make sense? Yeah. We you mean myself. don't mix it with the perf, you know, with audit tool? Yeah, don't mix it with the audit tool because then we specify specific thresholds we think for for our specific application, but the profiler right now seems very generic uh, to any operator. Where can go? Yeah, so what I, if it's the only doing the pprof, it makes sense. So it's only doing the, this profiling. However, uh, as as I saw the HTTP, you know, uh, metrics being collected, and I think those metrics, at least some of these metrics that uh, David is trying to, you know, account there, is in Prometheus. Is I listed there two metrics, but also in the kubevirt, uh, you know. Um, Code, there is this reflectors metrics uh, that it's also account the list and watch. Uh, although I cannot see the name Prometheus for some reason, you need to double check why it's not being exposed. But we, we have some metrics there. We should have some metrics there that it's showing, uh, you know, this API request. And, and I, I like the idea to have like a you know, this report showing many things. Um, but uh, if we go for this direction, I think it would be nice to get the data from Prometheus and dump in a report. And then it's pretty much what perf the audit tool is doing. You know, um, yeah. and, 
and then we could have them together. But if it's if it's only doing the uh, P proof, um, yeah, it can can be separate. So the, the, just I also comment that in the in the cluster provider uh, PR, uh, P proof uh, has two different APIs, so we can use one. It's what uh, David uses, and another another one it's expose it as um an api so so in this case you can also determine for example uh the amount of time that you want to profile like you are doing with the audit tools like uh, you know 10 minutes whatever you are doing and and also do some live you know analysis uh, during the execution of the code, so it can it's it has a user interface, you know, a GUI, so you can you can check that while it's running, and it might be interesting also. I'll take a look at the net profiling mm -hmm. that you've pointed out. I haven't yeah, I haven't looked at that in detail. I think that my um, my initial reaction to that is. Uh, how to access these endpoints. Uh, so right now I can uh, get ingress through the Kubernetes API server and through our sub resource endpoint and actually retrieve um, the runtime profiling data. The real time data, uh, we'd have to, I don't know how to aggregate that as easily. But that's something I'll look into. I think for the sake of this conversation, uh, it sounds like we're in agreement that PProf is useful. Somehow making that simpler for yeah. us to use. And all right, so we can probably table that and say, we're going to do something there uh, somehow. Um, when we look at this uh, profiler tool as it is now, we have PProf and then we also have this HTTP stuff that I'm doing. And the HTTP, TP, <laughs> HTTP stuff is a little bit controversial because it appears like it could be a Prometheus metric. And I've been thinking about that as well. I don't know how to get the data uh, from an existing metric. So what I want is to know exactly what API calls occurred on our specific resources from our components. And I've been unable to get that from, maybe I, I'm unaware of how to do it, but I've looked at it and I can't get structured the way I want out of Prometheus today. I could probably create a new Prometheus metric that pretty much exposes exactly what I'm doing. Uh, I think it's going to create a lot of indexes. Uh, so it might be something we don't want to always have enabled. Um, so I think it would probably be a histogram per a um, per an operation per resource. So like every list on a pod would be a histogram to count, like have the counts and things like that in it. What what would make I, I noticed that we are lacking some metrics that I was that I thought we should have before in the API server. Um, what kind of metrics are you looking for? The, the calls we cause or the calls we get? Because there's pods on it, so it means we make the call, right? Yeah, all I want is to know this is an, uh, I want to know exactly what API calls come from every component within our control plane over a specific period of time. So if I run a stress test, I want to be able to retroactively mm -hmm. look at every single API call, individual API call, the counts that have occurred for that. And if we see that, um, like, for example, we're calling 10,000 lists on PVCs, and that's not expected, I want to go and investigate that. Uh, yeah. Or if we see that there's new lists or new Git calls that are occurring, I want to be able to go and figure out where that's occurring and why. So I want to know exactly what component it came from, and I want to be able to identify that that's unexpected. So I mm -hmm. think we can see that with the the metric that we have already. How? The, also... the might, it might be not consistently, but yeah, go ahead. Right. So yeah, we can discuss it, and then we actually use it for, for me also. So for example, the API server request total, you have the verbs, so we can see at least watch. And and then you have the, you know, the groups, 
and that shows actually what's been called. Uh, and regard, so for example, if it's been called uh, pods, virtual machines, you know, it will be like the module of the components. And you can, you, it, it has, it's a histogram, so it has counts. So you can count that. Um, the metric you're talking about is the API server one? It's the API server, and also we have this, the, the REST. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that should The API us. server is not the one he was looking for, because that's any request made by anybody. And I think what they meant was the requests we make as the control plane, and that would be the REST client, but I'm not sure if we consistently used it everywhere. Like, But we should have, like, I saw something like that. We have the REST client metrics, the calls we make, but I'm not sure if they are really in every of our clients. But then we should fix that. So. Yeah. Let's say they are. Um, how does that give me the per verb, per resource information? How would I, how would I, uh, yeah, rather that? I don't have a cluster right now. It's booting. <laughs> I can't try. Um, Wait. Yeah, I'm also in the plus, so let me check. Uh, let's see if I have an example. Because that is where I tried and could not. Yeah, the, the rest climb metrics are. I had all, I also had a problem with the structure of them that I couldn't get exactly what I wanted. Um, like sub resources were were not a part of it or a part. I I I, yeah, I had some confusion with them as well. But I where are the metrics? I can't find the list anymore. Okay, let's look at this latency seconds and see what we're actually putting in there. Broken down by verb and URL. So what is verb going to be? Is that going to be get list watch or is it going to be something like I like, think so, yes. In Kubernetes, those are called verbs. Sure. Oh, so here's the thing. The URL, what, what URL is this? Is this the full URL that I'm getting? So when it observes, it, are we? I think it's slash API v1 etc. Uh, if I remember correctly. I don't think we're capturing the URL. So we get the verb and the latency. I think that's all we get. Yeah. Yeah, so there's no URL there. So we don't know what. We know that lists have become increasingly uh latent but we have no idea which ones or we can't individually count what urls are there that's actually tricky because it's difficult to uh figure out exactly what the resource was and whether it was a um if if we did that and we had a histogram for like we added a label for the exact resource that this is occurring on it's going to create a histogram for every resource. Oh, I was muted. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I was sorry. saying a lot of things. Also. I wasn't trying to talk over you. Yeah, we didn't hear you. So I, I just put here an, an example in the chat. So actually, the URL has the resource. For example, here, I have an example that it has the pods. So it's listing the pod uh, endpoints and all the whatever resource actually has been called. And it's uh, counting per um, 
you know, per component and in the and instance. It's true that it's missing. No, no, yeah. Now that I'm looking, it's true it's that we don't components. know where don't it's know coming. Where, yeah, yeah, exactly. Then we should extend this, isn't it? It should have like a, yeah. Yeah, like the API server has something that they call group or whatever thing that, whatever we want to call, it should have the name of the component, yeah. Yeah, it's probably built this way because the place where it gets injected, we might be able to fix that or pull apart the URL, which will be not the most beautiful way to do it. But yeah, but we should, should be we should clean it up. Do probably. Who is that causes a lot more, uh, like more histograms, right? So it, it right might now, cause less histograms. Uh, right now it will cause a lot because the URL is the full URL with resource version, everything. So it will spam like hell. It looks uh, like the resource version and everything's all normal. It's all taken out. No, from what he sent there, it's like the, the URL field is the whole request with parameters and stuff. No. Yes, that means it's like one one bucket per call, even maybe. No, it's just per resource. Like if you look at the endpoints, it, it looks like everything's just there's well, no there's no yeah. resource version or anything. The values and everything are taken out. Ah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I only right. I, I'm looking at the chat and, and then look like it's yeah, yeah, more. It's, it's tough. I had to really expand it. Um, yeah, and, and this is also a um, <clears throat> this is a metric that is provided by the Kubernetes. Like it's a native. I don't know how to describe it. It's it's something that's provided by Kubernetes itself that we are just extending from our components. Oh, okay. I thought we were, were we we built this. Wait, no, it's, it's, it's just part. It's not. It's not ours. Uh, ah, we okay. are using their wrapper around this too. Mm -hmm. But it, probably you can put the new label in it, at least, just to say which components calling that. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see. I'm trying to find what it's used. Uh... There's no, um, we're, we're, these are their callbacks that we are. Uh, I think I saw that in the code somewhere. Oh, it's, yeah, Prometheus. Yeah, so here in the, in the metric. Oh, okay, so. Even if we get this, I'm not sure it gives me the granularity. No, oh, yeah, I'm t entirely looking for. Mm -hmm. you, you basically want the same metrics the API server exposes, but limited to caller, uh, Kubernetes control plane, right? Well, like we can methods. make it individual pods and things like that, or individual component. Method, group, in and resource. That's the three things you want, right? Yeah. Maybe sub resource. Yes. Uh, I care less about sub resource. Yeah, it's, no, but... it's method. Uh, so the action, the resource, and the component that it comes from. Oh yeah, I need a component. Yeah. That, but that's like I, I wouldn't worry too much about. Prometheus load there. That is like the most basic thing everybody does. Um, if our Prometheus dies because of that, we should fix our Prometheus because that sounds like basic essential stuff. This can be a history. Can't be that much. Every combination of verb, resource, and components that we call. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's that is. Okay. 
The I API think that is requests, okay. requests, it's already doing some more or less like that. I mean, yeah. However, it's it's the, the different direction. And the API similar to just that as well. Um, yeah. So I think maybe it should have like a, something similar to API server, but instead of being the direction to the components, it's from the components. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it would be very useful to have that in Prometheus. I can create a new metric uh, that gives me exactly what I want. Uh, it would be yeah. a new histogram. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it's collide with the one that we have. Maybe we don't need both. So just we just need to check that. The, the one we have actually doesn't feel that useful compared to what we're talking about now, to be honest. No, I'm just saying that because maybe we just, yeah. you know, remove the one that we have now and yeah. have the new one. No, just true. If the new one we have the same uh, functionality as this one, we just we don't need this one anymore. Yeah. One thing that's also difficult here for me to understand is how would we, so I want to use this data, however we get it to determine when new API, when unexpected API calls are occurring, whether that's the frequency of the calls or if new ones have been introduced that uh, we don't expect to happen during a test. Now, when I retroactively pull this stuff, I would have to know if, like uh, when I request, uh, how would I get that, uh, the things that I don't know about, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. When I request the data, it would be a histogram with a label that I'm not expecting. So how would, how would I get information about the thing that I don't expect? You probably would pull a metric um, for the entire, like for all components and then group by component and resource or component resource and, and, and verb. And then you will see the numbers that you can compare to the previous run. You can see that. Okay. And then you, you, you actually see that gets before where uh, you can graph that you see gets before in the last call where four pots were much lower than gets are now by weird handler. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know how much you play with metrics, but you can group those metrics together so you only get what you want and you don't for, but you 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 get still get everything. That's paradoxical, but <laughs> okay. So here's what I think I'll do for now. Um, this uh, profiler tool, let's forget the HTTP stuff. Uh, and uh, I'll go with the pprof, I might clean it up. And if we think that this is a good idea, then I'll probably introduce the tool just with pprof for now, uh, mm -hmm. aggregating that. For the HTTP part, I'm gonna experiment with a new Prometheus metric uh, that gives me exactly what I want uh, and do whatever I need to do to get what I want. And then we can look at what I've done, figure out if there's an existing metric that gives us something similar. And if there's not, we can introduce a new metric and use that by the audit tool to uh, give us information about um, requests and everything. Does that sound reasonable as a path forward? Sounds great. I can't wait to see the, to, to try the pprof because, <laughs> because I'm looking at the go regimes right now and that, that would be amazing. Yeah, I think um, I think it would be good. Do you think, so we talked about like tool convergence and things like that. Um, I don't know if vert CTL is the right place for this even. Should I just create? I don't know if merging it into perf audit is accurate either, since that's a tool that retroactively looks at um, at this information. I can create a new tool that's just cluster profiler that's similar to perf audit, and then in the future, if we ever decide to converge those uh, to like the, the audit tool and the profile tool together, uh, we could. I could even just for now, since it's just pprof, I could just call it pprof um, aggregator or something. I don't know, something that's just specific to that. I wouldn't have minded it in Vert CTL, but I, I yeah, I think. A small separate tool for now would also 
help also I, because in, my, in, my, in back of my head, I, I still play with this idea of this being useful for other projects that if it's a small tool, it's easier to show off. You don't need VertCTL. And if we want to put it into VertCTL, we can just include it there then. Like, yeah. It's just a command if you use Cobra as well. It's just, you just register and you have it as well. Okay. The capture that we discussed. Uh, I wouldn't I, merge with the perf audit tool. I think it's different things and it's more interacting with our control plane and less. Like, the audit tool looks more like a Prometheus client right now, and I think that's something different. It's, it's generate a report, isn't it, with the metrics that we want. It's kind of, you know, showing the should the idea to have like a, it's it, right now it's only one metric, but we want to extend it for CPU, you know, usage, memory usage and many other yeah. metrics and show the report and the profiler it's just something that with more granularity isn't it so show, mm. showing the more profile is a dev tool the profile is a dev tool you use while working on the code mostly it's like the data you get from the profile is hard to compare run by run uh, you you it, it there is little value in, in collecting it per test run, for example, and, and padding them against each other because profiling data is hard to compare. But yeah, the, the, the PPROF audit tool is for sure. Uh, yeah. That's where I've kind of mixed the two things. The HTTP request stuff coming from the current profiler would be useful. So I need to yeah. figure that out. Um, right. And probably put it up. That's where yeah. I would separate yeah. tools, one being useful for performance measuring and the other one is more a dev tool that doesn't the data doesn't it's hard to aggregate for future runs okay mm -hmm. um all right so for the just to summarize perf scale audit tool that i have now we feel comfortable with that it sounds like and the, the workflow that i have there if so can we mm -hmm. get that merged i guess i don't know if we have any approvers maybe i can get roman to approve it All right, I guess a different way of saying that, does anyone have any reservations about merging the audit tool today and the scope of that tool? All right. It's fine. The only hold was from a seller, I, but I don't I, know if I just want your to question discuss, is off. Okay. Yeah, I put the hold just to discuss today regarding mm -hmm. just both two tools. So. note here. I will unblock that. All right. I think we're good with these two topics. Um, mm -hmm. Should we move on to this tracing experiment? I'd like to hear about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I spent Friday, last Friday, and then uh, I think yesterday because I was sick, um, looking at the go routines first, that's a bit below. And uh, during that, I remember that we talked about uh, tracing in the past and I was kind of feeling excited about it and I want to give it a try how complicated it is to add uh, Jaeger tracing and open tracing to a uh, vert handler. And it was fairly easy. Um, uh, it, I, I sadly don't have it running because my Azure cluster got killed. Um, it's rebooting. Um, but yeah, what I, after adding that and installing Jaeger in, in, in my open shifts, um, yeah, every run of Vert Handler's execute method got a, uh, trace I could look at. I saw the, I saw nice charts of how long the, each run takes and where it spends time. Uh, I haven't added a lot of, uh, spans, like trace spans yet, but like, uh, I should have taken a screenshot. Um, but what it basically gives us, you add two lines to a function and for that function, you then, it then shows up in, in a, in the, in the flame chart saying I spent this much time and I can add like added uh, the key. So it shows that root handler is looking at the virtual machine test and uh, that it spent so much time 
reading from cache and updating it and doing this and that, um, which is compared to the profiling, more work to add because you actually need to annotate each function to do that. And some of, and for some, like you, you also need the Kubernetes to, uh, to go context. So I had to change some signatures to have the possibility to create spans. Um, so it's a bit more work than the Go profiling, but it allows us to do it on the fly and add metadata. So compared to pprof, where you see how much time is spent in a single function in general, it shows you how much time is spent in a single function for this run. Um, which can be useful to debug uh, those, those scaling issues we saw uh, or um, any errors that occur. I'm not sure yet how much more it will bring us if we have the pprof stuff. So I'll, I'll keep looking at it. Virt handler was fairly boring. I um, only added it for the go routine stuff and it was hard to get in there because you always need to put context in and we like almost nowhere in our code, we probably propagate context so far. So it's um, quite some work sometimes, but yeah. So the context being, okay. Do we need an individual Con context for every key or something? Like how does this? No, you, are you familiar with the goal and context, context stuff? Like, Yeah, it's a, a way of specifying, well, Here's my rudimentary understanding. Uh, <laughs> it's a way of providing like timeouts and things like that for uh, yeah. API calls uh, per API call. Yeah. So, so the context you, you can you, you start with the, the uh, your root context and you can you, you pass it through your entire call stack basically, how, wherever you need it, how, however far deep you need it. And if you change it, you get a new context based on that. So it's Kind of mutable and what tracing does it uses that context like context is very useful to pass along stuff down the tree so tra what tracing does it it uses context to write on it and um like another way would be if you don't want to pass context you could pass the spans directly and, and build the tree this way but with context you already have that and um so Whenever you call a function, you pass it a new context based on your previous context with the new parent span, parent trace you have. And this way you get this, this tree of, of calls um, that you can then annotate. That's it. So it's both a cancellation method in, in concurrent Go, but it's also a method of passing along stuff based on each other. Um, I've had a logging library that also used that. So instead of calling a log.log .log like we do, um, which is kind of like some people consider it a bad practice because it's a, a um, global variable of sorts, our logger. It passes log to context and you can call, say like log from context and then add like VMI name. And if you pass the same context to the next function, it also has this VMI name in there and you can do structured logging that aggregates tags, for example. And that's what context is very good for. Okay, so f for us to enabling uh, enable this type of tracing and everything, we would have to <clears throat> go through the code and begin passing a unique context to the functions that we care about. Is that the gist of it? Uh, yeah, we, we need a, so to trace in a function. Like if you want to trace our reconcile loop, um, we create a context for each loop run. Um, that because like you, in, if you trace an HTTP server, you create a context per request. And for us, a request is kind of a reconcile loop. So yeah. you create a context for your loop. And if you want to know how long a function somewhere down the tree takes, like the, our template generation, for example, you need to pass the context from the top down to the place where you want more That's information. It. Yep. I got it. And that can be can be a bit of work. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's, that's pretty interesting. I think it's going to be really invasive. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. not opposed to it. I it think it also has some overhead. So I, I know that Jaeger, Jaeger can be disabled, but you know, it's introduced some overhead in the code. So just, we just need to be careful. 
my advice was to see how far we can get with the PPROF data. And if it doesn't give us yeah. the granularity we need, uh, then we can start looking at this, enabling this tracing. Like your experiment is pretty cool. Um, I see it being something um, <clears throat> more useful for uh, like an engineer who's trying to understand a live operation. So let's say I work at Uber and I need to understand why this specific uh, customer's request um, keeps getting some error or something like that. And we're spending the time where, where I can look at the tracing, I can look at the span of that request, see it traced through our entire like actual operation and then gain an understanding live how that occurred where with PPROF, we're just running this on our dev clusters uh, and running like stress tests that aren't like live. So we, we have a little bit more flexibility, I guess is what I'm getting at to not have to need yeah. something quite as involved yet. Yeah, maybe, I don't know if it doesn't give yeah, us the it, granularity, then it seems more, it is more a, an operational observability tool or less a, um, debugging or it can be debugging tool, but yeah, it, it, it's less, it's, it's more useful. Like if you experience problem in the cluster and you can look at that and you see like, or you see why VM is not spinning up and you can see it's waiting that the, the operator is waiting or stuck or taking forever in the reconcile loop and you can yeah. maybe see why. I would see like, uh, if we have some, uh, you know, we want to analyze, you know, a call across components, um, if we, we would have that. So a, a call goes to many different components and then we want to see what's happening and which components actually is the bottleneck. but. Uh, it's not what's happening. And so we want to actually trace the virt handler, for example, internally and see what's happening inside. Isn't it? And uh, PPROF can show that maybe. So uh, yeah, maybe the, PPROF the, it's, yeah. The difference is granularity. PPROF shows you how much time Go spends in a function and uh, open tracing shows you uh, how much time it spends in every call of this function. Mm -hmm. um, and it can give you the met metadata, metadata, like it spends more time in calls uh, in reconciling this single VM, while the other one is just generally takes a lot of time in there. So it's more operational. It's more if you if you have a running cluster and you want to see what's going on, while PPROF is more again for us while developing. So yeah, that's. I'm, I'm also still not sure how, how useful it will be. Um, also regarding the amount of work it will take to get it to the important places. And uh, regarding the overhead, um, Sure, it's like two more function calls per function that to to record a span and everything. But in general, the, from from my experience, the open tracing libraries and Jaeger libraries itself are really really performant. Like well, log, logging can be more ex, logging can be more expensive than that. I have a different um, experience. Like okay. disab <laughs> disabling Jaeger improved the performance in like very much so okay yeah uh, it, it, sure it, it also depends disabled, on how so you how you train is, yeah right it can be disabled by default and if someone wants it can be enabled also it has this flexibility yeah. right the, the the calls themselves and the functions are not the problem it's the recording that you enable or disable like there is a the collector in the background running that collects some spans and that's the part that can slow down and you can tell it to only sample like every second time or on probability and stuff like that. And then it gets faster again. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> any other thoughts on this tracing thing? Because I would mm. like to hear some more about the evaluations. Yep. 
I see that there's no 404 problem anymore looking at this yes. line. Yes, surprisingly, what, isn't it? So what, yeah, what, what's going on? So I run again. So as we talked uh, last time uh, with the update master repository, the same experiment. And there, are, the thing is the 4, you know, 04 problem was gone. So, so you updated to the latest main and it just disappeared. Yeah, some maybe some PR was merged. I, I the point is since we are not tracking PRs, um, unfortunately I don't know what fixed that. So, but it's I don't I don't know. And but it's kind of good and bad at the same time. Bad because we don't know, but good because we don't have this problem anymore. So yeah, I don't know what's really yeah. interesting. Uh, I'm gonna share the tab. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, this was um, the read code request, which the API, you know, server request, but only for the cook read calls. Is the duration and, is that always a minute, like, or is the metric wrong or egg? Uh, this is interesting, isn't it? Because I thought it was very, you know, super high one minute here. Um, however, I see the same thing in the Kubernetes calls. Uh, I don't know. I was expecting to see this very, just too high. This is only for a read, watch, and uh, list operation. Um, I don't know why it's too high, but yeah. if you take out the watches, it might be lower because watches are ongoing requests. Yeah. Maybe I should see here actually which operation is is the one that takes too much time or if it's all, but it's yeah it's something weird one minute here isn't it? Um, mm. It's one minute the maximum bucket or something. What? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. it's got to be the watches because it's just leaving the connection open. Yeah. Forever. Mm -hmm. So probably that. Maybe I, I can split. You know, in the, uh, the watch and the other things. So I, in general, I would dump the ditch watches because for request duration, watches are probably irrelevant because they they are long running anyways. I'm actually more interested if we have short running watches than long running. Huh. I mean, if they get canceled all the time, yeah. Yeah, or we have to keep resyncing for some reason or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, but that would, that would show up in the lists as well. We would see a lot more lists because there's a list and then the watch for our informers. Yeah, those requests look way better. Yeah, so we we still see now, uh, we still see some, you know, uh, 40, 409 requests here, but it, they're very low. So should be fine. And I got this new metric, which the, okay, so if you guys want to discuss something here. Um, well, one question for this, this dashboard, could, um, could you add the number of uh, virtual machine VMIs to the graph somehow? So when you we, we have here you know you you know it's I have 10 it now. and here it's 100. if you go down i have it now number of vmis oh two down now sorry a little bit upper oh okay uh uh ah, yes. okay oh yeah that's great okay yeah <laughs> i, I <laughs> yeah i, I need to to update the the you know this new grafana dashboard i keep, i'm keeping on updating that to improve so um, yeah. probably you don't you don't see this uh current there um yeah this is the number of vmis now it's also although it's only showing the running here it's also show when it's something fails now here uh the number of vmis it's running and fail i omit the ones that are zero that's why you don't see mm -hmm. the the legend here yeah. anyway um yeah, so regarding the, the rest uh, rate limited duration, um, this is a metric that uh, Roman enabled. I think it's, this is interesting. 
And this metric shows how long the height limiter uh, wait until it's, you know, uh, uh, and uh, how, what's the best word to say that? Until it's uh, enable the request go through. So it's the throttle, it's, right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Throttling, yeah. Do we yes. ever drop, does the rate limiter ever drop it or is it going to hold on to the request indefinitely until it can try to execute it? Yeah, I think it's hold on and then, okay. And then, you know, uh, permit it to execute. So it means that uh, if we, uh, with the PR that Roman creates, now we can, you know, increase the rate limit and these numbers here should be smaller. Uh, in the cold, I see two uh, thresholds there. One is they, they call long running thresholds, what was 50 milliseconds. And uh, another one that it's long running thresholds, it's one uh, second. So if, so, uh, you know, just analyzing this, it means for me at least that all the requests should be under 50 milliseconds, isn't it? And what we are seeing here is way higher and definitely we need to increase this, you know, carry per seconds, things that Roman enable that, especially for virt controller and virt handler here and so on. So mm -hmm. this is the new metric um, and it's it's showing that we have some problem here and with the Roman's PR probably will fix that. Or something that we need to fine tune here. Yeah. Just, just a small note, like because we talked about it before. I really think we should like find a way to clean up our client metrics because yeah. URLs this way in the metrics are are yeah, so like everything you need in there is is pods mm -hmm. and maybe the IP. No, only pods. And that's like, that's also and waste of data in Prometheus. Guardian. Mm -hmm. That's true. And uh, maybe the instance, uh, you know, yeah. I think maybe it already has this, yes. But yeah. yeah, by the way, so that's why I got confused before because these metrics here actually show the components, isn't it? Just uh, rest rate limiter. So uh, Roman, it's enabling this. Uh, and this metric is actually the same, uh, you know, in the same file that we enable REST client, REST latency, request latency seconds. So, and Roman it did a similar metric, but in uh, enabling the name of the, com uh, the component. So uh, maybe it's the name of the, let me see what I did with this metric, just one second. Yes, this is the name of the container. So the name of the container shows the name of the component and was, you know, easy to, to check that. Mm. Uh, although this metric here, it's showing uh, regarding the rate limit, but we could potentially have the metric or trying to see, uh, expose the name of the, the, the container, for example, for the other metric. And maybe we we will have what we want. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing that I want to discuss here, it's actually, uh, I don't know if uh, David, if you saw that I mark I marked you in this document. So. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you receive any uh, some invitation for that. Any just just to, to be sure if. You, you guys get notified if I do that, something I like that. I did. Uh, yeah. Can, let me, can you um, hit that arrow on the, uh, oh, or you can just do that. This. Yeah, basically what I see here. So if you yeah, see, maybe I can this. just comment here. There is some mismatching here. So VM creation time and VM phase transition latency. See, it's way uh, lower. Uh, the, the transition latency. I, I understand that we will have some mismatching here because this is some general uh, aggregation in the transition latency, 
but not that high, isn't it? This is because it's missing the scheduling phase. So it has the running, the schedule, but not the scheduling phase. So I don't know what it's gone. Uh, it's not collecting that. So what would you expect to see, I guess? I, I know you would expect to see the scheduling, but is this, is this phase transitions um, from one another or is it phase transitions from creation? Uh, this specific graph that we're the first one is it's from creation to running the VM creation time. Okay. The second one is the transitions, which the each individual phase in it. However, I would expect in, uh, but do the scheduling is isn't it, isn't it the from creation to scheduling? What's the baseline from the uh, scheduling time phase? Uh, because you have like, a, you know, I was expecting creation to scheduling, then scheduling to schedule, and then the schedule to running. Yeah. Isn't it? Let me take a look. There might be a reason that we're missing that. Uh, I misunderstood what the creation time means. I, th like I, I was trying to find out what it means. And you, you say it means from the time the, the resource pops up the in the ETCD. You create the to option. where it becomes running. Okay. Yes. OK. So it takes five minutes at that point of time for it's the worst case. to be created. It's 95% nine, yeah. of And in the late and uh, on the one to the right, you would also see a total of five minutes, but you're missing the one. The scheduling, yeah, it's <laughs> so, more time scheduling. So, hmm. I don't know. If this is possible. We might be missing if it occurs really quickly. We might be missing it. Uh, so it's scheduling the scheduled. It seems like that should be a while though, and that should be the one that takes a while. Yeah, it should isn't, be the isn't there also pending? There is pending scheduling. Pending is when no notice. Like I, I had pending yesterday with this error. I think Marcel, you also had where mm -hmm. the VMs couldn't be scheduled even because of some permission issues. Yeah, but and then the, it's first really, pending. It might be it should have pending, but this is only if there is no enough resource or a specific node. Uh, that we want to place um, uh, here. So first of all, I, I check it all the the phase that it's in this uh, metric, and it's only three: schedule, running, and succeed. Uh, because after I delete that, it gets succeed. And actually, the deleting I'm not showing here, but uh, it succeed takes a lot of time. Also, it's Which something one does? that. Uh, to Which delete one? so delete okay yeah that takes a long time because we're actually um waiting for the pod to terminate uh, which could uh depending on how the virtual machine was created uh there's a transition or i'm sorry a graceful period where we wait oh, so, so really? it, it could be like 15 to 30 seconds by default and somebody that has like a windows machine they said the things like an hour because sometimes windows updates occur during shutdown uh, so that one's kind of depending on how you structure your VMI, it may or may not reflect anything useful. Mm -hmm. It's the VMs are not being booted, so yeah. So you you think that it would shut down pretty quickly? Yeah. Uh, anyway, so we, we I will investigate why scheduling isn't being set. Um, yeah, it's curious to me. It could be and either pending maybe as well. Can we get that as well? Yeah, scheduling and pen so we're not seeing pending either. Um, I think because it's not pending, but I, 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 I'm not sure. So I'm not seeing pending yet. I thought we had a pending state. Maybe. Yeah, we do. Yeah. <clears throat> 
but I think pending, maybe it's not getting pending, you know, because I have enough resource, a lot of resource in the node and the scheduling is not pending. It's just scheduling. However, I don't see the scheduling phase. So it, yeah. it doesn't it have to be impending always because until it get pick, gets picked up, like our operator will set it to scheduling, you know, like it, mm, even if you have I, a lot of resources, will start impending and be there until one loop. I, I think it gets to the scheduling so. phase, isn't it? So the pod, yes, but the VMI, I think it's once the pod gets scheduled, it's the right goal to the scheduling phase, isn't it? I would yeah, say but it takes... pending, we're going to create the pod, then it's going to go scheduling, and then once the pod is uh, running, it's going to go scheduled. Yeah. Okay, so you guys think we should see some pending? Yeah, I would expect to see pending. I will investigate this. I felt like I saw them all when I tested it, but I only tested the VM creation time one. So I, I did running, uh, scheduling, and I, I layered them all together. It actually gives a really similar result to the VM phase transition latency. You could just use the two creation time as well. It would just look, I think it would look pretty much exactly the same. Would it not? Maybe. Maybe it's slightly different. Instead of yeah, instead of stack, <coughs> you just uh, excuse me, just overlay them, isn't it? Because it's the sum. Yeah, maybe I can I can do that. And if you do that, do we still have value in the phase transition between each other? Maybe, I want maybe to ask that. Okay. <sighs> okay, for the first one, let me check. Double check now. I can I can do this right now. Let's see. Did you did you try the rain tank export this time? Oh, the export? No, I didn't do that because, you know, the export, I need to save it locally in the cluster, isn't it? No, uh, no, you, you can you can snap you can snapshot to the cloud or to a local file and share that, and you can then we can all browse to Grafana live in Grafana. Oh, this next shot, yeah, you mean, sorry, I just don't do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we're, we're over time. I just looked at the clock. Right. I don't want to yeah. uh, write <laughs> this out true. too long for people. Uh, okay. I would double check that and I let you know this. Yeah. Is, is there anything else quickly that anyone needed to bring up uh, that we can't carry over until next week? Um, Blocked or anything like that? No, I, uh, if, if, so if you have time, have a look at the go over to teen leak investigation. I think I found a few spots, but um, I'll fix them once I get oh. the tests running and see if I actually fix them. Did you link to that in this document? Yeah, it's uh, the last item, word handler resource leak investigation. OK. Yeah. All right, I'll take a look at the there. And so... one comment I made to, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just regarding this, uh, you know, uh, leaking, you know, yeah. this goal routine. I was thinking that you mentioned that it's hard to uh, close some some of the goal routines because we lose the, you know, the track of that. Maybe I was thinking if we have by default all the goal routines with timeout, we could solve this problem. Mm, maybe, but it will still give us a long tail of, of leaks and right. it's not hard to close them. It's the, the part was that was hard for some of them is to find out if we close them. Like the code is a bit mixed up how, where they get created and where they get closed. There is closing for a lot of them, but it's hard to see if it, if like, it's hard to see if there's a, a code path that doesn't. And I'm trying to investigate those oh, to see which ones are actually so offending. Um, and uh, what I shared before, uh, you missed a lot. If we do tests like that, um, also if we add performance tests to our code, it would be great if we can like put the exact specs we need to r run those tests somewhere. Because I was trying to run the density test and I didn't know what I need, like how my cluster has to look. I think it's in here somewhere and now. I see it. Um, but if we add perf tests in, in the test suite, it should 
tell us what you need to do to run it somehow? Yeah, I submit a PR for that, so it will, should be okay. there. But anyway, we, we I can document. I don't know where. What's the best place to put information for that? But with the test, maybe, or with uh... oh, you mean a readme in the test? For example, yeah. Okay. I don't know what you just think, but oh yeah, there is another thing here. So I don't know. We are out of time, but you know, just just to mention. So the CPU request usage. So I don't know if it may be an issue. It's maybe a, it's an issue for scheduling. You know, uh, the not the CPU that is requested and the CPU that is used uh, in the the components it's the cpu request it's way low than the cpu that it's being used for virt api virt controller and we have an alert of that when it's happening in our uh, cook virt uh, you know uh, you know code and probably this alert it's been raised a lot of time and no one has seen that uh, but is something that maybe we need to improve that you know fix the cpu request we sh the, the the request should be the smallest amount the controller needs to run what we would set otherwise is either increase them at runtime with an auto scaler or set limits with an auto scaler and we have the story of investigating that because so, if we increase them now people could could not run it anymore we don't want to set a limit mm -hmm. because we might get, yeah. uh, I don't, it's more important for memory that we don't set a limit, but we don't yeah. want to set any limits. Requests, uh, that needs discussion. Uh, if we go over, the problem is that we can be evicted uh, in certain scenarios uh, and rescheduled mm -hmm. other places, and we don't necessarily want that to happen either. So we want our request to be accurate. Um, yeah. And if we are consistently over it, uh, that's not a great thing. Uh, yeah, we should we should understand that a little bit better. Uh, I think that's one of those things uh, when we look at the perf audit tool that we need thresholds for as well to set a threshold for what we expect to occur with CPU and memory and uh, what actually occurred uh, with the actual usage if it ever peaks over it. Because um, yeah. that's a indication. What I mean is we shouldn't set it higher than the minimum because if you run it on a minimal cluster, you shouldn't. It, you couldn't schedule it if you didn't have the resources. Uh, that's why we should look, at, or what we discussed before, that we should look at uh, the Kubernetes horizontal and vertical pod auto scalers to change that when the demand increases. So the auto scaler would see, okay, this operator is is using so much resources. Let's give it more requests so it's reflecting. Yeah, it does the that actual... by killing the pod and restarting it. There's, I'm not right now. It does. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have some comment about that. So it's, but okay, we don't have too much time to discuss that, guys. But there is another. I I put like a link in the to discuss that. Actually, it's the last link here that I call SLOs, SLIs. So in this document, so Kubernetes actually Kubernetes has some uh, uh, analysis. Is the the maximum number of VMs that they should. Uh, that they support per node and that's they 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 don't overload the kubelet for example we don't have this kind of analysis i'm planning maybe to 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 arrive with this analysis in our experiments and this should show us the these limits isn't it so that we want to have for example let's assume that maybe the best limit that we have it's 160 vms per node and then we can check here you know, uh, su supporting 106 VMs per node, what's the limit that the virt handler, uh, the CPU, the minimum CPU request that the virt handler should have for, for this, you know, um, uh, things that we support. And then we keep with this uh, Sure, values. and we can add tunings for uh, different like cluster sizes on the Kubernetes CR yeah. if we needed to. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, if right. we add One this, we need to make it tunable, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I added a link or a uh, topic for the agenda for next week to handle uh, this memory CPU request on pause discussion. Let's carry it over there. I think 
let's yeah. just call a meeting. We I don't want to take anyone else's yeah. time. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for joining. This was productive. Thank you. Thank right. you guys. Catch Bye. you all next week. Bye. Bye.